Hi, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to Hanford Live. Uh, this is the third online conversation regarding the online clean, excuse me, the ongoing cleanup at the Hanford site in central Washington state. Two in-person public Hanford regional dialogues have been held since the 2017 inaugural Hanford Live and TP agencies are using a variety of ways to reach those interested in and affected by the cleanup at the Hanford site. My name is Ryan Orth. Uh, I'm a neutral third party facilitator. So glad to be here with you this evening. My role is to help keep this meeting on time and on track and ensure that as many people uh, who wish to ask a question are able to do so within the allotted time tonight. Uh, I'm joined by representatives uh, of the three agencies referred to as the Tri-Party Agreement Agencies. Uh, they are reflecting their commitment to work together on the Hanford cleanup mission. And uh, we're also joined tonight by the chair of the Hanford Advisory Board. And I will introduce them here in just a moment. Uh, but a few remarks in advance of that. First, on the purpose of tonight's meeting, uh, it is to provide a forum for dialogue between the TPA leadership and the public, uh, to provide an opportunity for the TPA agencies to communicate key messages regarding Hanford's past, present, and future, and to provide you uh, all with an opportunity to ask questions, express concerns, and learn about the priorities and current activities related to the Hanford site environmental cleanup mission. So let me go ahead and uh, share with you uh, our agenda for this evening. Uh, the meeting is going to begin with some opening statements by each panelist. And following these opening remarks, we'll begin with a moderated uh, question and answer session, taking questions from the viewing audience. Uh, questions submitted in advance of and during this broadcast will be consolidated by staff and then provided to me to ask questions to our panelists. In order to get to as many questions as possible, questions with lengthy preambles uh, may be edited for time. Uh, just so you know, uh, and I will follow the same principles of meeting conduct that we would if we were in person, uh, that questions and comments are constructive and courteous. Uh, I may ask questions of one or more panelists during the Q&A session and panelists may comment on each other's responses. And in all cases, I'll ask our panelists to please be succinct uh, in, in their responses so that we can get as many questions in as possible. And I may also restate questions if it appears that the response kind of missed the intent of the question. So we'll get to as many of these as possible after remarks uh, by 7.20 PM. And then we're gonna be concluding with some brief closing remarks and wrap up by 7.30. So a couple of notes about the Zoom uh, format and feature. You know, instructions for participating in the question and answer session uh, of this webinar were distributed by email in advance uh, and available on the project website. Uh, you can use uh, the Q&A button to uh, submit questions, and that's at the bottom of your screen. The, you'll see that the Q&A window will pop up there, and uh, you can uh, expand that and uh, submit uh, your questions through that so that they can get into our queue. We want to get in as many questions as possible uh, and as well as allow as many people to participate as we can. So please submit questions that you have, uh, you know, if you have multiple questions, please submit those separately or if you have follow-up questions, go ahead and, ahead and submit those separately as well. Uh, participants aren't going to be able to see your questions until it's marked as ready to be answered. Uh, and in addition, 
many questions have been submitted in advance and won't be showing up in this Q&A list. So um, we'll be going back and forth between pre-submitted questions and questions that come in live. Uh, it's likely based on the number of questions that we'll have uh, that not every one will be able to be answered during the live webinar session due to time. Uh, if you, for any reason, need technical assistance during the session, you can reach out with an email to hanfordlive at rl.gov. Again, that's hanfordlive at rl.gov. Uh, that email address was also noted in your registration. This event is being recorded uh, with a link that will be posted uh, to the Hanford and Ecology YouTube channels by the end of this week. A uh, written summary of the questions and responses will not be produced. If you would prefer to uh, view this event with closed captions, you can view a live transcript by clicking on the settings uh, shown here. Uh, you can just go ahead and click on that and toggle on and off to show the subtitling. We will be uh, submitting or uh, distributing an evaluation form uh, and providing a link for that online survey at the conclusion of tonight's event. We really hope that you take a moment to provide us with your response as we're always interested in learning. Uh, more about how we can improve these types of interactions and, and events. So with that, uh, I'd like to go ahead and uh, ask our panelists to turn on their video and we'll begin with some introductions for them. Welcome everyone. So um, let's start off. Uh, Brian Vance is the manager of the Department of Energy Office of River Protection and the Richland Operations Office. In this capacity, Brian is responsible for an overall annual budget of nearly two and a half billion dollars and oversight of the contractors and more than 11,000 employees involved in cleanup of the 580 square mile Hanford site. In his role as manager, uh, Brian is responsible for the safe and environmentally acceptable cleanup of the site, including groundwater remediation, hazardous waste and facilities decontamination and disposal operations, treatment and disposal of radioactive chemical liquid waste, and the design, construction, and commissioning of the world's largest complex of nuclear vitrification facilities, the waste treatment and immob immobilization plant. Uh, Brian has more than 30 years of experience in the nuclear industry. Ben Harp is the deputy manager for uh, Department of Energy Office of River Protection, often referred to as ORP. And in this capacity, he supports the manager in the safe storage, retrieval, treatment and disposal of 53 million gallons of chemical and radioactive waste at the Hanford site including building and operating the processing facilities to vitrify Hanford's tank waste and protect the Columbia River. Ben has served with Department of Energy since 1991. Uh, Brian Stickney is the deputy manager for the Department of Energy Richland Operations Office, often referred to as RL. In this capacity, Brian is responsible for oversight of daily operations, program planning, project execution, budgeting compliance with Hanford Federal Facility Agreement and Consent Order, also known as the Tri-Party Agreement, and safe, environmentally acceptable and responsible management of the Hanford site. Uh, Brian has served at Department of Energy in several management roles since 2009. Uh, Dave Enan is the Section Chief of Site Cleanup Section 4 in the remedial cleanup branch of EPA Region 10's Superfund and Emergency Management Division. Uh, this section is focused on federal facilities covering Army, Navy, and Department of Energy sites in the states of Alaska, Idaho, Oregon, and Washington. Uh, Dave has been in this position since 2018, but has been with EPA Region 10 for over 30 years. 
David Bowen is the Washington State Department of Ecology's Nuclear Waste Program Manager responsible for management and direction of personnel and budget resources to accomplish the program's mission of the effective and efficient cleanup of the Department of Energy's Hanford site and ensure sound management of mixed hazardous and radioactive sites to protect the air, water, and land. David started as a nuclear waste program manager in December of 2020, coming from Ecology's Central Region Office, where he served as the Water Quality Section Manager since March 2016. And Steve Wigman represents the interests of uh, public at large on the Department of Energy's Emergency Management Site-Specific Advisory Board at Hanford, also known as the Hanford Advisory Board. A uh, resident of Kennewick, Washington, Mr. Wigman retired from his roles as a consultant and senior technical advisor for Department of Energy's Office of River Protection between 1997 and 2010. He spent more than 30 years working towards safe, effective cleanup of Department of Energy sites and brings a broad knowledge of cleanup issues. Mr. Wigman is current chair of the Hanford Advisory Board, vice chair of the Tank Waste Committee, and has served on the board uh, since uh, 2016. All right, welcome everyone. We're glad to have you here. Um, we're going to turn to remarks from our panelists now, uh, opening remarks, uh, beginning with the Department of Energy for an update on Hanford cleanup. And so I will uh, turn it over to Brian Vance and start his slides now. Great, thank, thank you, Ryan. And uh, I wanna thank uh, certainly the panelists and everyone for joining us here this evening. Um, it's, it's always important for us to provide updates on our progress. And we're able to do that tonight with our regulators and the chair of our Hanford Advisory Board. Um, and, and we have a lot to talk about and a lot to share. Um, I'll provide a little bit of history on the site, uh, some context uh, relative to our current state of play. And then I will turn it over to Ben and Brian to provide uh, specific updates on the projects and activities under the Office of River Protection and the Richland Operations Office. And then I'll, I'll wrap up with a few remarks before we turn it over to our next speaker. Um, if you go to the next slide, Ryan, the, the history of the site, I think, um, was, was really started in the Manhattan Project uh, in uh, conjunction with World War II. And the National Security Mission itself ran until uh, 1989. Uh, during that National Security Mission period, um, the site uh, operated uh, nine reactors uh, during the mission of more than four and a half decades, um, produced and irradiated 20 million uh, uranium rods, fuel rods, uh, processed 110,000 tons of irradiated uh, fuel um, and through five processes delivered uh, more than 60% of the nation's plutonium uh, during the national security mission. And what you see on the slide today is, is uh, the H reactor, one of the nine reactors along uh, the Columbia River. And what, what I think it's important to provide a context of is what cleanup looks like. Um, and so, um, so if you look at this picture, what you see is all the operating infrastructure, uh, the facilities, the, the um, utilities above ground, and there were underground um, facilities as well, and piping, piping and, and cableways, things like that, that were all required to operate just one of the reactors along the Columbia River. And so, Ryan, if you go to the next slide, um, you can see that by 2016, this is what that site looked like. And the only remaining facility there in the center is the actual reactor itself that's been placed in interim safe storage. Um, and, and the rest of that site uh, area, all those facilities above and below ground for, to, to, a, to a large extent have been uh, removed. And so that, that, that example, that one example um, has, has occurred throughout the site in multiple different locations. Um, six of the other reactors look very similar to this one. Um, and, and so that's one example of what cleanup looks like. And we've actually taken to place signs up on the site where cleanup's completed because often you can't 
our, our objective is to create an environment that, that was similar to what um, the site looked like prior to the, the national security mission. And so we put those signs up as reminders, but also sources of pride for the workforce who has been a part of this cleanup effort for more than uh, 32 years. Uh, the next slide represents another example of, and this is the underground and portion of the cleanup. Uh, what you can see is uh, underground contaminated uh, groundwater from the contaminants that uh, were placed into the soils and ultimately reached the groundwater um, during the national security mission. This is in the K reactor area, which you'll see some pictures of later on. Um, and that, and you can see the area of contamination uh, that was adjacent to the river um, in, that, in the central portion there. And then we established uh, groundwater programs um, along the river and now in the central plateau as well. And the objective of those programs is to remove the groundwater from the underground, underground volume uh, treat and remove the contaminants, replace that water, clean the clean water back into the ground, and, and over time shrink the plumes. And if you look to the right from the 1996 picture on the left to the picture in 2019 on the right, you can see the plume reductions across that area. And specifically, you can see the reduction in the plumes that um, were have a, access to the river itself. And, and so that's an example of the effort that's put forth um, uh, in multiple places. And today we have five um, pump and treat facilities that actually treat water, groundwater continuously uh, along the river. One additional uh, site in the central plateau in the 200 West area. And we treat more than 2 billion gallons of groundwater per year to continue to um, clean up the contamination uh, that's reached groundwater remove that contamination, uh, safely store it or dispose of it, and then ret return the groundwater, the water back to the water uh, table, um, and, and really just continue to, to the very important effort of cleaning up the contaminants and protecting the Columbia River. Um, it, it's really not visible to the naked eye, but really very, very important to the ecology and the environment of the Pacific Northwest. Um, next slide, just as a summary of the macro level of the cleanup progress that we've uh, we've accomplished during the first 32 years. Um, as, I, as I mentioned, the cleanup history is truly important. And um, so we start with the upper left, uh, six of the nine reactors along the river um, placed in a, a similar condition to what you saw uh, for the H reactor, and we have two remaining in the K basin, and, and you will have that discussion with Brian in a few minutes. Uh, one preserved as a national historical monument, the B reactor, and then we have two reactors remaining. Um, 27 billion gallons of groundwater treated, um, more than 932 facilities demolished, as you saw from the picture of the, the reactor along the river. That's one example of the, of the cleanup. More than 1,300 waste sites remediated, and a tremendous amount of cleanup. And in, in parallel with all this cleanup activity over the last two decades, uh, we've constructed the, the treatment facility that we used to, for the first phase um, or to begin treating the low activity fraction of the tank waste in, in just a few years. So a period of, of, of progress, we have a lot of work to do, but we've made a lot of progress and we set the conditions for what I think is a very exciting period of cleanup to come. Uh, the next slide is, is really an overview. Uh, Hanford is one of 16 uh, environmental cleanup sites managed by the Department of Energy's Office of, of Environmental Management. Uh, Hanford is certainly the largest. Um, our mission, the safe, efficient, effective cleanup of the Hanford site that is protective of the workforce, the public, and the environment. We do have two DOE offices, as I've, I've described. We have six major prime contractors that support the cleanup effort. As Ryan mentioned, $2.5 billion annual budget, uh, approximately 11,000 employees over a 580 square mile site that encompasses about 40 uh, miles of the Columbia River. Um, we certainly recognize and, and have feel a responsibility uh, to protect the economic center of the state, uh, agricultural industry, um, and we see that as an important part of our role. What you see here is a picture of three areas of the site. The tan uh, area was really a part of the um, safety and security buffer for the site during the national security mission. And at this time, there was no cleanup activities 
uh, going on there. And that's actually largely managed by US Fish and Wildlife Service on behalf of the Department of Energy. Uh, the green area represents the river corridor. Um, and that you can see the, the upper part, which is actually to the north, the locations, the nine reactors that were along the river um, that were, were working to produce the um, fuel or, or, or radiating the fuel to produce the plutonium. Um, and we really only have two major cleanup activities left along the, the river quarter. The 300, 324 building that's down in the three, 300 area, down in the bottom, bottom right, and then the K uh, east and west reactors up to the northern part of the site. Largely the rest of the river has been, river corridor has been cleaned up from a demolition perspective. We'll still continue to pump and treat and there's still some uh, remediation sites there, um, ground remediation sites, but largely cleaned up. And then we're shifting a lot of the work to the central plateau, that purple area in the center where you can see 200 east and 200 west and the inner area there, which is where the tank farms reside, waste, waste treatment plant resides and some of the other facilities that we're in the, actively in the process of uh, remediating exist as well. Um, our overall strategy for the site has been to clean up along the river, move towards the central plateau over time uh, for that phase of the mission. Um, and I think we'll move largely stuck to that, that, that philosophy and that strategy from the very beginning of the cleanup. Uh, next slide represents our contractor partners with the Department of Energy uh, going clockwise. Uh, Washington River Protection uh, Solutions, uh, led by John Eschenberg, uh, is the tank farm uh, uh, operator. Um, Bechtel, uh, led by Val McCain, is responsible for the construction, startup, and commissioning of the waste treatment plant that will vitrify uh, the low activity waste fraction of the waste in the near term and ultimately treat uh, the rest of the waste in the longer term. Our, our, our occupational medical services provider, HPMC, is on the chart providing occupational medical, go ahead back, back Ryan, uh, to the site. HLMI is our 222S lab managed by Don Hardy. Uh, they support the tank farms and a lot of the industrial health samples on the site. Uh, Central Plateau uh, cleanup company uh, led by Scott Sachs is really the river and plateau cleanup com company. And the uh, Hanford Mission Integration Solutions uh, led by Bob Wilkinson is really the integrator for the site, provides site services to our contractors and also ensures that um, we uh, look at the site holistically. And, and really all of our contractors are supported by many small businesses um, regionally and locally uh, to support uh, what I think is a, is, a, is a very important cleanup effort across um, for the Pacific Northwest. Uh, next slide, just to give you a little bit of an overview on COVID before I turn it over to Ben. Um, you can see, uh, you know, it's certainly, it's been an important part of uh, our last 15 months uh, to ensure that we, um, we were able to safely uh, uh, maintain the site from a, from a safety and security perspective. Um, and also as conditions allowed, begin to uh, resume the work that's so important to uh, our cleanup mission. So in March of 2022, uh, we transitioned effectively overnight to uh, max telework and we put 6,000 people on telework almost overnight um, we engaged uh, immediately with our community as the largest employer in the Tri-Cities to make sure we stayed connected to our community leaders throughout the pandemic. And so our situational aware awareness was good as we made decisions about the site. Um, and we, we uh, implemented CDC protocols um, to ensure the safety and health of the workforce that were coming to the site. And even during the period from March of 2020 until we began our first remobilization activities, in May of 26, we had more than a thousand people coming to the site every day to ensure uh, the safety and health um, of, of, the, of the site and the security of the site during that first phase of the pandemic as we implemented all those controls. On the 26th of May, we, we began our uh, a slow, methodical, incremental increase in our workforce posture uh, when the conditions supported that. Um, in parallel with that effort, we started our training program up with the Hammer Training Facility to make sure that as workers came back for the site, they were they were trained and, and ready and qualified to go conduct the work um, that they were, you know, we continue to progress um, incrementally over the that period of time. 31st of August, we transitioned to phase two. And by the 30th of September, we achieved a, a posture that we're largely in today, about 60% of the workforce uh, coming to the site every day to progress the mission, 40% uh, on telework. And you can see as we go around the pictures from the upper left, um, 
you know, physical uh, and administrative controls put in place to ensure the health and safety of the workforce. Um, you can see below the on the right, the, the, we, we looked um, at how we would manage workforce density uh, while we, we executed work and the contractors worked very diligently to look at shifting and resequencing of work and were really innovative in how they did business. And again, our hammer training facility basically revamped their entire training, training program, all their facilities to support the training activities that are so, so important to our work. And then we, we embraced the telework world. Um, and we did that not only with our internal to our own workforce, uh, between the department and our contractors, but also with our, our, our key stakeholders, the tribes, um, the community leaders to make sure that we maintain a community, continuous dialogue and maintain that engagement uh, with the community that's so important uh, to our work as we go forward. Um, every project and activity has been impacted by COVID, um, but I think what you'll see in the, in the coming slides is the progress that has been made um, is, is impressive due to the phenomenal work of our, of our DO, DOE team, our contractor team, and with the support and assistance of, of our regulators to continue to make the progress that's so vital to our mission and deliver the risk reduction that's so important to our community um, and our workforce. And so I hope that sets a good stage uh, for what you'll see in the coming slides about progress. But as we get into the, those slides, I think the most important thing to recognize is our top priority uh, remains the health and safety of the workforce. And, and that is a, a, a strand and a theme that I think you'll hear and see throughout our presentations is how, how important we, we, we take that as a responsibility and how important our workforce is um, certainly to deliver that progress. So I'll turn it over to Ben for the updates on the officer of protection areas of responsibility. All right, next slide. I do have to tell a story though that um, a friend of mine, uh, he said, man, you look great. Um, as far as, uh, he's, he sees me on video here, but um, anyway, this is 2015, uh, the waste treatment plant. Um, and we were at that time trying to, you know, get the, final design, construction, everything done. Um, if, you, if you go out there today, which if you switch to the next, does it go 2018, 21? You can see the, the video of all the streets and the finalization of the waste treatment plant. It's, it's amazing when you go out there um, from construction, they've turned over all kinds of um, uh, systems, they're, they're doing um, final preps, they're getting ready for operations. It's, it's kind of an amazing system. And this, it's not just the waste treatment and immobilization plant, but it's uh, the tank farms getting ready uh, to deliver feed with uh, tank side season removal and, and other things. So what we've done over the last two years of, is integrated the not only the Office of River Protection, but the um, Regional Operations Office for delivering water, power, and other things. It's It's been an amazing transition. And um, we get up every morning and discuss this at 7 a.m. of what we're gonna, you know, what the priorities are. And um, not all, you know, it's, it was, you know, we. We had a little hiccup with um, with uh, you know, COVID and other things, but we've worked through it. It's it's just amazing that you can see the transition from um, what it was to what it is today. It's it's an amazing process, and we're going to get this thing started up in 2023. So, next screen. Like I said, we had tank side cesium removal system testing. Um, it's ongoing. It's going to be up and running here pretty soon. Um, it's we're doing the operational acceptance testing. Uh, as you know, we uh, did the fluid management facility. Uh, we didn't want to process a lot of water back to the evaporator we had in tank farm, so we. Um, constructed a new um, evaporator out at 
out at the waste treatment plant. It's it's up and running. Uh, we went out there last week with uh, EM3, went through a, a walk down of it, and it, it's pretty impressive uh, where they're at. Uh, analytical lab. Um, so we have an analytical lab at uh, WTP. We also have a lab at tank farms that had to uh, step up uh, to make sure that the waste acceptance criteria was going to be met. And um, we just went through um, contract transition and it was, um, we did a, a great job with the contract transition, making sure that everything's in line to make sure that we can uh, supply feed that's going to meet the waste acceptance criteria. And you can see that we've hooked up the transfer lines and then uh, you see the, the manipulator arms at the waste, the, the law facility. So everything's on schedule to get going um, by the consent decree dates that, that we committed to. So it's great story um, uh, transitioning from a construction to an operational aspect of uh, what we need to do as a department. So, all right, next slide. Uh, you probably heard that we did have, we discovered that we did have a single shell tank B109 that did have a leak. Um, we go through evaluations. Uh, we do um, lots of evaluations as far as leak detection monitoring. Um, evaluations of, we did analysis of uh, the construction of the tanks and other things. And um, so we're in discussions with the state on what we're gonna do with B109. Uh, this tank, uh, we're leaking probably a thousand gallons, 2000 gallons per year. Uh, we've, you know, this, how the tanks operated in the past, we had um, discharged several hundred thousand gallons. So we're, we're looking at it from a risk standpoint, but we're looking at options such as a um, barrier or something. So no other um, leakage can come into the tank and leak out of the tank. And we're working with the state to make sure that that doesn't happen. So. It's, it's been in the news, but um, from a risk standpoint, we think it's minimal risk since uh, these tanks are cascaded. Uh, that means that we used to discharge lots of gallons of waste into the, into the groundwater, but, um, and it takes years and years to get down the groundwater, but we are working with the state to make sure that um, we can come up with option to uh, deal with this tank. So next next slide. And you can see we have pump and treat systems in the area. Uh, we do 2.2 billion gallons of pump and treat. And we do have pump and treat in the area of the tank that we have there. So we are um, dealing with the contaminants, uh, pump and treat as far as uh, the contaminants go in that in that local area. So with that, I'll turn it over to Brian Stickney. Thanks, Ben. Uh, good evening, everyone. I uh, appreciate you all uh, spending your evening with us to learn a little bit more about the exciting cleanup mission here at Hanford. I'll be covering our uh, major risk reduction projects to give you a feel for the kind of work our contractor uh, partners are accomplishing both along the Columbia River and up on the Central Plateau every day. And so what you can see in the screen here, this is the uh, 100K area, and it's located about a quarter mile away from the river, way at the north end of the site. Um, over the last several years, we've removed nuclear materials from the area and are really preparing to place the last two of the reactors into interim safe storage, um, which is also referred to as cocooning. And you saw this earlier when Brian Vance had the picture up of the H reactor area, the, the sole building remaining. That's what this will look like in the short future as well. So um, 
the next slide shows you some of the, or not next slide, but the transition here shows you where we're at today. And you can see the substantial footprint reduction that's been going on at K. And the last time we talked to you at a Hanford Live event, uh, we had just finished moving about 35 cubic yards of radioactive sludge from the water-filled uh, fuel basin, uh, fuel storage basin over at the K West reactor, which is on the left of your screen. Um, and we moved that into safer dry storage away from the river uh, up on the central plateau at T plant. So moving the sludge out of that uh, K area and up to T plant really paved the way for us to remove the large water filters and debris from the K West basin later this year, um, removing the water from the basin next year, and then over the following two years, filling that basin with grout and removing the basin itself. Later this year, um, we're gonna begin cocooning the K East reactor on the right side of your screen. And that work's gonna take approximately two years. Um, so this work here, um, combined with the 324 building remediation, which I'm gonna talk about in a few minutes, and our ongoing network of pump and treat operations uh, represent the last significant cleanup along the river corridor, which is an indicator of significant risk reduction uh, that we've done safely over a series of years and, and we're quite proud of. Next slide, please, Ryan. So moving up to the central plateau, uh, we continue to accomplish significant risk reduction activities up there. Uh, I'd really, I guess, like to, uh, to start your attention here in the, uh, the upper left um, of, of the picture. Um, and that's uh, from the um, former plutonium finishing plant that was demolished by our previous contractor. Um, our new contractor, CPC Co. Uh, workers, they're removing the last of the contaminated rubble from demolition activities. Um, and other work that we expect to finish by this fall is the uh, core sampling beneath the building pads of the former plutonium finishing plant, and then stabilization of that site with a clean soil cover. And so that's a significant accomplishment uh, that we've made um, over, over a series of many years. Moving counterclockwise, the photo on the bottom left shows a concrete pad that was poured during the pandemic. Um, and that, that'll be used to hold dry casts filled with radioactive capsules. So workers uh, every day out there are working on installing the systems and facilities needed to transfer about 2,000 capsules of cesium and strontium from uh, storage in the water-filled basin in our waste encapsulation storage facility to this pad uh, for safer, secure storage uh, in dry casks. And uh, this is work we expect to have accomplished in the next several years. What this does for us is it eliminates the risk of a potential leak in the basin during a major earthquake uh, and any subsequent spread of contamination. Um, I, I would like to highlight that there isn't a big risk of contamination right now because of administrative controls we have in place to be able to immediately re refill that basin with water and keep it filled. However, um, it would be nice to not have to do that and, and put these in, uh, in a safer configuration that doesn't require that administrative control. So the photo in the center on the bottom shows workers training on procedures for uh, doffing their anti-contamination gear in the 324 building. The 324 building um, is uh, an important risk reduction project for us in just north of the city of Richland, right past the uh, Pacific Northwest National Lab. It's a former nuclear uh, materials research facility. And um, in the distant past, contaminated liquids leaked into the soil beneath the building. And so um, we're continuing to do work here to prepare the facility for us to go in and remediate that soil. Let me go back to the slide, thank you. Um, in the bottom right uh, photo, um, this is back out at the plutonium finishing plant site. Um, workers finished stabilizing three underground waste disposal structures earlier this year. Um, these structures were at risk of collapsing from our engineering studies and they were identified as part of our continuous risk assessment and prioritization process, um, which evaluates aging structures on the Hanford site on a continuous basis and uh, allows us to identify those that we need to go stabilize. So this photo specifically shows the largest of the three structures, the Z9 crib, and it is, uh, was filled and stabilized with engineered grout that covered the contaminated materials inside, preventing the crib's roof from a major collapse that could have potentially stirred up and spread contamination into the area. Um, and so this was a significant risk reduction activity um, that, that, uh, that was able to be accomplished this year. 
Um, lastly, in the upper right, I just want to mention our progress um, to progress the tank waste treatment and risk reduction mission is supported by our site integration and infrastructure. Um, in the photo infrastructure workers here, they're installing temporary scaffolding um, uh, uh, used to inspect uh, large water tanks that supply water suppression water um, in the event of an emergency at a few of the, our facilities just north of Richland. But this is really just representative of one example of the comprehensive infrastructure that we have and we work on uh, every day, which is necessary to run the site. That includes you know, providing water, sewer, uh, road maintenance, reliable IT, especially important during the uh, the global pandemic, uh, firefighting and Hanford patrol. And, and all of these are necessary to provide the safety and security every day for a site that if you haven't been here, we're talking um, half the size of Rhode Island. So uh, a pretty large footprint. So as I hope you can see, you know, our workers are doing a tremendous job uh, of progressing a very challenging mission on a number of projects. And we, as we continue to progress the risk reduction mission, the safety of our workforce continues to be our top priority. And I uh, appreciate your time. And, uh, and I'll turn over the briefing back to uh, Brian Vance for concluding remarks from the department. Thank you. Okay, go ahead to the last slide, Ryan, please. Just a, just a couple remarks. Obviously, this is a period of dynamic change and opportunity for the Hanford site. Um, you know, we've worked through uh, the pandemic. Um, we are preparing for a a complete transition to the site operational posture that supports direct feed low activity waste operations, which is both DOE offices, all of our contractors working together uh, on the site-wide machine. We completed in the last six months, three major contract transitions, three of those contractors that I mentioned in my previous slide, there's been transitions there, um, as well as other changes um, you know, in the national uh, arena as well. And, and continue to focus on the health and safety workforce, safely progressing the mission and doing things that are protective of, of our workforce, the community, and, and certainly the Pacific Northwest. We're proud of what the, the Department of Energy and the contractors working together have accomplished um, through many challenges uh, successfully over, over more than 15 months. Um, we're fortunate to have such a, a, an exceptional group of talented professionals in every functional area supporting the mission and consistently demonstrating dedication, uh, tenacity, innovation, flexibility to further the, the mission of the site. And I'm very optimistic about where um, our what our future holds for us from a cleanup perspective, based largely on what we have accomplished as a team through this very challenging time and what we're poised to, to do in the, in the coming um, months and years. And so it's, it's really an exciting time at the Hanford site uh, you can feel it among our, our team. You can see it on the site in the workforce. Um, and that's really uh, very, very, very important. And certainly a, a sense of pride that we all have. And I think certainly um, should be reflected in the, in the community and the region for the people that come here every day and really deliver spectacular uh, taxpayer value for the work they do. So I'll turn it back to Ryan. Um, thank you for your attention. I hope that provides a good context for the questions that will follow. Uh, and Ryan can introduce our next speaker. Thanks, Brian. And thank you, Ben and Brian as well. Um, yes, let's uh, move along uh, for the state regulatory perspective. Um, we're going to have David Bowen from the Washington State Department of Ecology. David. Thank you, Ryan. And uh, my slide has gone back to energy's last. If you go to my second slide, that'd Here be we great. Go. Thanks. Perfect. And uh, really appreciate the overview from energy on the site and all the activities going on out there. I have a couple of thank yous to start off with. First of all, I want to thank all of you listening in and sending in questions. You know, it's uh, what 620 on a beautiful Wednesday evening here in Richland. Uh, I think it's 79, 80 degrees outside. Uh, so you could be anywhere and you're here with us. So I appreciate that. And then also the tech and uh, communications team that helped put this together. I uh, really appreciate your efforts. I know it doesn't, doesn't happen overnight, so I know a lot of work went into this. Um, so with the site kind of covered, let's go to my next slide. I just wanted to uh, introduce myself as a relatively new person here uh, in the mix of, of folks working at Hanford and uh, talk about ecology's regulatory role. A little bit on the tri-party agreement, the progress we're making with permitting and ongoing work that we're doing throughout COVID, and then the holistic negotiations piece. Um, 
over on the left, you can see the Hanford site. I think Brian has already gone over that really well for us. So let's go on to the next slide. So as far as um, some background on me, uh, the introduction, I've been with Ecology for five years. I came out of the Union Gap office for water quality as a section manager there. Uh, learned a lot about permitting um, groundwater, uh, pump and treat, all those types of things in that role through all our permitting processes. Uh, experience before ecology, I did spend seven years as a county elected official, first as a county auditor and then as a county commissioner. So I learned a lot about um, you know, regulatory roles and, and uh, citizens and buy-in from folks and trying to uh, do what's right for the community and uh, figure out what that is. And sometimes that's a difficult thing to do. I've also spent some time in corporate and small businesses as senior manager and in ownership. I've uh, worked in renewable energy, conservation, uh, retail, everything from food and beverage to automotive collision repair, uh, insurance claims, uh, a lot in the corporate and small business area. Also spent a couple of years in economic development and property management, where we worked on a conservation project for 55,000 acres. It's now a, the, um, now a, a large um, community forest up in the Clay Elm area. Um, I've worked in business recruitment. Uh, building restoration. There was a business incubator associated with the organization I was with. So we would uh, low rents for people to come in and start their businesses off and help them with uh, technical information and assistance. And then one of the last projects I was working on before ecology was developing some co-working spaces, uh, two of them in Kittitas County. And for those folks working from home uh, who maybe wanted some socialization and uh, a place to also mix with folks that maybe had complimentary things they were working on and, and, and meet people and, and promote their business and, and grow. Uh, so that's uh, kind of the experience. And then um, otherwise, I'm a 50 year plus Central Washington resident. I grew up um, in Kittitas County. I went to college at CWU, raised a family there. Uh, my wife and I between us have five kids, two of my own and three of hers. Got them all through high school, graduated and college, military, etc. And then I spent uh, um, 25 years assisting my grandmother with her cattle farm and horses. And we still have a few horses around. So I, I've kind of got a, a broad uh, perspective of community, of work, of the, the, the stresses that uh, a regulatory agency has, as well as those being permitted and regulated. Uh, some government experience, and which has all been in the last six months, I've realized is really important for the role I'm in here. Let's go to the next slide. So ecology's role, and you know, we take um, our obligation very seriously. And ecology is authorized to implement federal environmental laws at Hanford. And we do that through the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, the Re Resource Conservation and Recovery Act. And also um, we implement the Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation and Liability Act, CERCLA, or uh, you might know it as Superfund. Uh, so those are the kind of the, that's the framework that we work under. Uh, to do our job and, and uh, to provide um, both support to energy and their cleanup effort and also oversight and, and, and those types of things. Next slide. So the Federal Facilities Compliance Act um, requires a re enforceable site treatment plan and schedule of treatment and disposal of legacy waste at Department of Energy sites across the, the country. And for our site, the tri-party agreement is that Hanford site action plan. It's also our circular compliance order. And I'm, I'm apologizing ahead of time for the acronyms. I did pull them out in that first slide. So that as I slipped through here, uh, you would know what they were. It includes an action plan uh, with numerous milestones for completion of various tax tasks on site. And uh, I think a lot of you who are really familiar with this know those milestones can be moved and have been moved historically to address funding and other issues that have run, been run into over the years. Picture over on the left are the folks who signed off on this, um, but I believe it was back in 1989, uh, then Attorney General Governor Greg Weyer, um, the governor, and then uh, Energy and EPA. Uh, cutting some cake is what they're doing there, um, but I didn't, there wasn't enough room on the slide to show that piece, so next slide. So besides, uh, you know, the compliance work and enforcement and all the things you probably read about in the paper, I wanted to give people an indication. You know, we, we do permit modifications as well and permit writing. And you know, this is the last update I had um, in May 
there were 63 different permit modifications going on at this time. Four of those were initiated by us. The rest of them were initiated because of uh, either new infrastructure on site or new activities people wanted to do uh, at facilities that already existed, adding new facilities, whatever it might be. And so the blue area is class one. Those are what I had always referred to as minor modifications, uh, change in text or a piece of equipment that was specifically called out and it's been changed out with something else. Class two will generally have some sort of a comment period associated with it. And uh, it's a little more extensive, has a little more process. The class three will usually, will generally have a public meeting or two uh, along with comment periods. And so there, there's various stages depending on how in, in depth or how major the change in the permit might be. Uh, next slide. And you heard the, the team before talking about all the projects on site. And uh, this is a different way. The pie, pie chart kind of showed the number. This show, this graph shows you know, where those different permit modifications are at. And you can see that tall blue line there is the waste treatment plant. And that's where 22 or so of those permit modifications, so over a third of them are being taken place there to support DF law, trying to get that to come online. Uh, it's really important for us and for energy and EPA to get treatment started. And uh, we're doing everything we can to facilitate the, that startup uh, on time, on schedule on time. Next slide. So uh, ecology, and this is holistic negotiations. Uh, ecology and the Department of Energy entered into a consent decree in 2010. And that decree was to address uh, aspects of tank waste treatment, a high level waste vitrification, pretreatment, single shell tank retrievals, and, and all that goes with that. And it was becoming apparent that some of the milestones that I mentioned earlier were beginning to slip or were in danger of being upslipping. So we proposed a holistic negotiation waste retrieval for waste retrieval treatment. And it is being mediated uh, by some federal mediators to help us with the discussions. Um, EPA is participating in the sessions along with uh, Ecology and DOE. Of course, Department of Justice and the Attorney General's Office have joined us uh, with the legal agreements that are involved and you know, just the high stakes that are involved on site. We had originally been meeting, the, a large group meeting monthly, smaller groups meeting weekly, and now recently we've, um, it's called a smaller group, but I think there's 24 or so of us in this group that are meeting on a weekly basis now, and, uh, and we've agreed to keep meeting at least through the end of this month, and I just have to say that I, I really appreciate the transparent and frank conversations we've been having over since probably February or March as we've been coming closer and closer to understanding of exactly um, where each energy and ecology are coming from and um, starting to talk through paths forward. So I, I'm looking forward and optimistically, cautiously optimistic as we go forward with holistic negotiations. Next slide. And I'm gonna wrap it up here. Um, I just want to, uh, you know, my first six months, it felt like, uh, Two or three months, I was being chauffeured around or was a passenger in the car and uh, learning all the pieces. Uh, Department of Energy took me on a socially distance tour of the property on a couple of afternoons in January. Uh, very informative and you know, everything I was reading, all the reports I was seeing, all the infrastructure I was seeing, you know, aerial photos of, I got to see it on the ground. It was really helpful. Um, and so I, I, I would say probably by the end of March, I was starting to feel like I was getting in the driver's seat and puttering around the back roads and I'm starting to get up to speed now here in the, the six month in this position. It's actually six months today. So um, I'm, I, I love complex projects and there isn't one more complex than this. So um, I've been really enjoying the job. And if you uh, wanna point out now that uh, we do have several comment periods open. And if you'd like to go look at uh, the, to the topics on those, some of those are TPA milestones, some of them are permits, et cetera. Uh, please go to ecology.wa.gov Hanford and um, provide us your feedback. Appreciate it. And I'll turn it back to Ryan. Thanks, David. Uh, and now for the federal regulatory perspective, I'll hand it over to Dave Enan with the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. Good evening, and, and I want to echo David's thanks to, to, to you all for for joining us. Um, it is awfully, awfully nice out and, and dinner time for a lot of people and, and you are choosing to spend your time with us. And I, and I 
I really appreciate that public involvement and and, and having people, in, citizens and, and others involved really makes a difference in the cleanup. Um, and then also the, our, our, the, the folks behind the scenes that have made this happen. Um, it's a it's a significant effort, and I, uh, I really want to want to thank them for that. Mm -hmm. Next slide, please, Ryan. So, you know, a lot of most of my folks are have been here a long time, but I've got three new people that have joined in the last in the last six months. Um, we've got Roberto Armijo. Um, he came from the Peace Corps, Peace Corps and recently finished his, his master's degree. Jeff Schramm joined us from Energy's contractor here on site and, and joined us from the Department of Energy. We, we were able to, to coach from them this time. So we're, we're very happy about that. Next slide, please. So what is EPA's role at, at Hanford? Um, and basically it gets, it's to the, the, I'll go ahead and cheat and use some of the acronyms since, since David already defined them, the, the circle of the Superfund cleanups. Our job is to ensure that those cleanups are protective of human health and the environment. Um, we have, you know, one of the, the mandates is that they're, they're effective and everything else, but our, the, the, the main thing is protective of human health and the environment. Are we also one of our, our values and, and roles that we take very seriously is to ensure that the public is involved in the decision-making process in accordance with these regulations that we are, are, are implementing. Next slide, please. So again, David kind of touched on these. Um, you know, the bulk of what EPA does is is CERCLA or Superfund, and it's the those cleanup decisions that get public comment and so forth. Um, the other the, the dangerous waste, hazardous waste rules under RECRA. That's the program that is delegated to the state, and and yeah, there's conversations between between our program and and theirs, but it's they run it um, and, and run it well. Uh, next slide, please. And again, the. Federal Facility Agreement and Consent Order Tripartite Agreement was signed in 1989. Um, and in that picture, if you can remember it in your mind, you had Attorney General uh, Gregoire and then the EPA Regional Administrator, Roby Russell, the Site Manager, Mike Lawrence, and then Governor Ruth Gardner. Th those are the, the, the people in that photo that were cutting the cake to celebrate the, the signing of the agreement in 1989. Uh, the Department of Energy is the lead agency for cleanup and under, under, under CERCLA. That is how um, the, and, and the, the executive order, they are designated the lead agency. EPA provides oversight of the, the circular cleanups um, and, and that oversight was divided as between EPA and ecology and it's in it's assigned in the within the agreement tri-party agreement next slide please our priorities um, and, it, and it's uh, reflected in in what you see us ask for what we what we focus on, obviously, it's cleaning up along the Columbia River first. Um, not the least, you know, we've got all the reasons why the Columbia River is important and economically ish, um, tribal interests, uh, 
it's the, the, the would be the pathway if you would if there's a release say the groundwater to the river to downriver um, groundwater restoration across the site is is, our, is something that we value um, we want to make sure that we're making progress on on characterization of the sites on the central plateau so that we can actually get to them we can make cleanup decisions and then implement the cleanup um, this may seem sort of strange to to put on here um, but actually discipline project management and meeting schedules and milestones we, that's another value um, something that is you know, be sure you see any news from the administration. Uh, you know, our, our trust and, and treaty obligations, that's something else that is that we're have kind of a renewed focus on. Um, and environmental justice and climate change. Those are all things that, that are getting a, a renewed look. Don't know exactly what that's, how that's gonna be reflected in, in the cleanup yet, but those are our questions that we're gonna be, be answering with our, our state and, and energy partners. I think that's the last, do I have one more? That was the last slide, Dave. That's what I thought. Thank you very much. Thanks. Um, and now Steve Wigman's here to offer some community perspective. Steve? Thank you. I want to thank everybody that is enjoying this tonight instead of being outside. And uh, just want to remind you that one of the reasons that we have such a beautiful place to be is because we have made a lot of progress on cleanup. Uh, I first came here over 40 years ago, and my job was to help Rockwell begin to comply with environmental requirements that were newly being applied to DOE facilities. And I have to say that the pictures you saw of the progress that's been made are the things we used to lose sleep over every day for years. And we needed that progress. That risk reduction really matters a lot. And I can tell you that I retired here. I raised my kids here. Um, I built a career here, or several of them. And uh, it gets in your blood because it's so important to the people of the Northwest now and for generations to come. Uh, that this risk be managed. And we all have our own opinions about what that might mean. But I can tell you that from what I've seen, once a decision is made to take an action and we don't deviate from that decision, that action gets taken. And that's where we really need to be now is to keep this sense of progress. I really wanna thank everybody I want to ask everybody that's watching this to thank the 10,000 plus employees that are making this happen for us. Their dedication and creativity has, has really put this place in a position where that beautiful live ribbon of the Columbia River that flows through here and ties all the Northwest together, uh, spans cultures and economies and all kinds of ideals. So I'm very pleased that uh, we're in this gig together. This is a multi-generational project and it's gonna be going on for a long time and we have to have a long-term perspective. Uh, but I, I, I can say that things have happened slower than I had hoped, but faster than I thought they might. So. It's hard to gauge sometimes how fast things can be done. Um, next slide. Um, I guess I'm semi-qualified to provide a local perspective because I represent the Hanford Advisory Board. And 
That board consists of over 30 seats of individuals from various organizations around the region who have an interest in the successful cleanup of this place. Um, the advisory board, uh, we, we argue with each other a lot because we each have our own opinions, but we try to develop a consensus advice that uh, kind of coalesces the ideas that are trying to be accomplished. Uh, one thing we're proud of is the advisory board developed some um, values a few years ago to help uh, guide the decisions and, and discussions. And the top two are protecting the workers and protecting the Columbia River, followed dead heat with protecting them and restoring the groundwater. So we believe that right now the Hanford Advisory Board's uh, perspective on values is similar to the agencies who are trying to complete this job. Uh, we represent a very diverse set of interests that are affected by Hanford cleanup. And that set of interests is getting even broader as we're beginning to add seats this year to better reflect the uh, heightened diversity of the region. And we're really welcoming new voices to the discussion. We've had a um, strange time during this pandemic of learning to meet virtually and also transitioning to a new facilitation contractor. And I'd, I'd say with some amount of pride that we've survived that. We're looking forward to getting back to real meetings. Most of us are not used to this virtual world and uh, we're looking forward to not being in it as strongly as we are now anyway. Uh, next slide. Uh, looking forward, obviously the extent of public involvement in decision-making at Hanford has varied over the years. And we're getting to the point now where uh, we've got some big decisions that need to be made by the Department of Energy and the agencies. And we would like to make sure that the public values are openly represented. Now, I'm not saying they're not, but we know better when they're representative if we get to participate in the decisions. And a couple of the big ones that are coming up, you've heard mentioned is the holistic negotiations and the alternative study for completing the treatment of tank waste. That's, that's a big deal to all of us. Um, and that's something that we would like to participate in before it's completely decided. Um, very big item right now is the initiation of the direct feed low activity waste program. It's our first uh, real close opportunity to actually begin to treat tank waste. And that's a very big, important item for all of us. Uh, like, like me, the tanks are not young anymore and some of them are as old as I am and beginning to uh, have those kinds of issues. Um, the integrity of the tank storage system, waste storage system is just a big concern to us. The cesium and strontium capsules have been in wet storage for a long time and contain a great deal of high level materials, very radioactive, very risky. And uh, one of the old timers told me a long time ago that that was probably the most dangerous set of contaminants on the, on the site. So we're really looking forward to getting those into dry storage. And like I said, we're very much looking forward to the holistic negotiations and high level waste alternative studies being done and continuation of the site remediation that has already been discussed. Um, next slide. Now there's lots of opportunities to get involved and it's just, you know, one of those things you have to decide individually how far you want to go. Uh, the Hanford Advisory Board meets regularly. Our meetings are public. Um, we would like to see more public um, at our meetings. We'd like to see more comments from the public at our meetings. We're striving to make our meetings inter interesting enough to make people want to come and, and say, their, say their views. 
Uh, there's lots of public involvement opportunities through the permitting processes and other activities of the site. There's speaker bureau program. And um, right now there's virtual public tours, which are quite well done. And we're hoping to get back to real public tours in the future. Um, I think that's what I wanted to cover. Uh, appreciate the opportunity and uh, be glad to help answer any questions. Thanks, Steve. And that concludes our opening remarks. Uh, we're going to turn now to the question and answer portion of the event. Uh, thanks to each of you for setting the stage. And before we begin, just a couple of quick reminders. Uh, we're going to be taking questions through approximately 7.20 PM Pacific. Uh, we've had a number of questions that were submitted in advance and quite a few that have started to come in. Um, these are uh, being consolidated consolidated by staff and then provided to me to uh, share with our panelists. Um, go ahead and use that bottom at the uh, bottom uh, of your screen button at the bottom of your screen. Thank you. Um, and you can submit additional questions if you have them. And we're going to try to get to as many as we can um, and may edit some preambles for time. Uh, ask that panelists be concise in their responses. Uh, we did get one question asking about the number of participants uh, on the call. We had a peak of about 150. Uh, we're down now to about 135. And there are about 20 folks that are joining us on the Facebook live stream as well. So just for your information, and thanks everyone for joining tonight. So let's go ahead and jump in. Uh, the first question that I have here is, um, what technologies and methods are in place to ensure tank integrity? Thank, thanks, Ryan. I'll just jump on that one. Um, I think we have a, a, a very robust tank integrity program for both the single shell and double shell tanks to make sure that we uh, continue to monitor the tanks very carefully. On the double shell tanks, there are some new technologies relative to uh, ultrasonic testing and our ability to actually get underneath the tanks and, and take photographs and uh, video of the underground uh, under uh, underground portion of the annulus section that's in a refractory underneath the tanks that is still relatively new, but we're we're working our way through the tanks there and, and continue to look for technologies that will help us um, continue to maintain the integrity of those tanks while, while we get the capability and start treating waste and ultimately um, ensure the tanks last as long as we need them to, to the maximum extent possible. Uh, but ben, may, ben certainly may have some additional comments to make, so I'll, I'll kick it over to Ben. Yeah, it's, a, it's kind of a three-pronged approach. So we do chemistry control because they're um, carbon steel tanks, so we keep the pH levels way up. Um, we've done corrosion probes and like Brian said, we've invested in a lot of technologies and recently the ability to uh, have crawlers that go underneath the tanks. Um, Savannah River and us um, do technical exchanges to make sure that the ultrasonic testing on this, the side of the tanks, we can see if there's any issues with uh, thinning of the metal. Um, but chemistry control and other things, we've actually switched our chemistry controls over the last year or so to make sure that we're uh, maximizing uh, the ability for the metal to be there over the long term. So um, it's a very robust program. Um, and it's it, it doesn't rise to the level of nuclear safety, but we do have uh, controls in place that are um, what we call operational safety requirements. So we maintain chemistry and other things uh, with corrosion probes and, um, and we keep investing in technologies. In fact, WSU, uh, and we, we put out a, an offer for colleges to do the, the different little robots that can crawl underneath the tanks to make sure that we're there and um, what we've discovered is that we need to get to the bottom 
one inch of the tanks to make sure that we're within those controls. So very, very important to us given the life cycle of what we're doing dealing with. Thanks. Other uh, responses from panelists before we move on? Steve? Yes, I, I just wanted to say that uh, the Hanford Advisory Board's tank committee receives regular and very thorough briefings from the contractors on this program. And in fact, we just uh, agreed on a letter of appreciation to the folks who do that for the, the dedication and the accomplishments that they've had. Uh, that does not diminish our concern about the aging nature of the tanks and the long, long time that we're going to need them. So this is a very important program for the site. Thanks for that. All right, let's move on to another question. As a reminder, I'm going to go between pre-submitted questions and questions that are coming in live. Uh, the next question, I think we'll go to ecology first on this and maybe then to Department of Energy. Hazardous waste laws re require leaking high-level waste tanks or any hazardous waste tank to be emptied immediately or as soon as feasible. Tank B109 was known to be leaking in 2020. Indeed, liquid levels were reported as thousands of gallons fewer in 2020 than 2018. When will USDOE and Ecology take action to remove the leakable interstitial liquids from B109? Thank you, Ryan. Great question. And you know, the TPA lays out a process, the Tri-Party Agreement lays out a process on how we respond when we receive notification of a leaking tank. And it was suspected to be leaking, and the actual assessment to determine if it was or not was done in July of 20, started in July of 2020, and we just received notification at the end of April 2021 that it indeed is uh, is leaking. And um, you know the TPA protocols require uh, energy and ecology to get together and uh, with at the project manager level to determine you know next steps and try to come to agreement on what, what steps to take and, and what the time frame might be and all of that. Uh, you know, we started initial conversations in May uh, at the management level on how to set that up and, and get people going. And then we've had three project team level meetings um, since then to talk about ideas and options uh, going forward. And I um, saw an email earlier this week uh, with some of those ideas and, and thoughts. So. Um, if we, we hopefully can come to a, an agreement on a solution going forward. And if we don't, you know, ecology always can um, go through an administrative order or other, other action. We always reserve the right to do that. It's not where we'd like to go. And I'm hoping we can, we can find a path forward, you know, and, and I'm, the only other thing I'll say is um, when you're working with uh, hazardous materials like this, everything takes time. And the folks in energy can tell you more about what kind of time frame that might look like, depending on what the solution is. I think I'll stop there. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in and just provide a little more context to add uh, to what Ben framed and what David framed as well. So um, B109, 530,000 gallon tank built in the mid 40s, one of 40 tanks in the beef farm complex. Uh, B109 itself was operated from the mid 40s until 1978 when it was taken out of service, um, determined to be sound at that point. And uh, in 1985, as a part of an overall risk reduction effort, um, all the tanks had the, uh, many of the tanks had liquids reduced. And so at the end of that process, there was about 13,000 gallons of drainable fluid in about 70,000 gallons of salt cake, which is um, I, I think a B109 uh, really is a wet sponge um, when you try to, and it's difficult to measure the liquid levels in there. It's, it's really looking inside of the sponge to determine liquid levels. We're doing it at one point. So it's not a simple float type uh, evaluation or a picture that you can look at and see the leakage. And the tanks are open to the atmosphere. So there's evaporation that processes occur, as Ben mentioned, some in leakage periodically. And so it takes several months and in looking at multiple indicators to determine that a tank is leaking. Uh, Bee Farm Complex is eight miles from the Columbia River. Um, it's two miles from any other infrastructure in the 200 west area or 200 east area. Uh, and there's no infrastructure in the Bee Farm Complex itself. 
Uh, the tank uh, is underground, single shell tank, about 200 feet above groundwater. And so if, uh, you know, we estimated about three or so gallons per day, about a thousand plus gallons per year. Uh, and that leakage uh, of contamination will take estimated at least 25 years to reach groundwater. So it takes a very long time. Um, it's in an area of the, the central plateau where uh, about half of the tanks in the bee farm area of that 40 tanks were determined to be leakers um, during the national security mission, leaked about 350,000 gallons of, of, of tank uh, contamination into the soil. Um, but as a part of the, the process that was used and Ben mentioned cascading of tanks, um, 50 million gallons of tank waste discharged directly to the soils during the national security mission. And so it's a, it, if we look at B109 within the context of the amount of leakage into an area that's already heavily contaminated, it represents no risk to the public, no risk to the workers. And there's already an aggressive pump and treat program already in place, as you saw on the slide. Six million gallons of groundwater pumped out of that area per month in an area where B109 might be weak, leaking um, 100 gallons per month and not even reaching the groundwater table. And so when we look at, when we make decisions at the Hanford site, it's really about risk decisions and um, the, the budget is, is limited. And so we, we've got to look at the context of the risk that this adds within an area that's already heavily contaminated, the amount of resources, dollars it would take to do anything more in a tank that only has 13,000 gallons of drainable liquid uh, in it relative to other priorities around the site, which represent a much higher risk to the workers, the, pub the public and the environment. And so I, I, David and, and the ecology team will work, sit down and, and continue to work that issue uh, with the department team. Um, but we have to continue to look at every issue on the site within a risk profile and make sure the dollars are well spent. Um, and, and, and so that process will continue and I'm sure we'll reach some type of conclusion that's appropriate um, in consideration of the concerns that ecology may have and certainly the department has. Um, but if, if, we, if we are driven to, to go and do something like dewater, we're gonna have to stop doing something else that represents a higher risk. And those are the type of conversations we have to have with ecology and we'll continue to do so. Uh, thanks, Ryan. All right, uh, let's move on to our next question. Could you provide an update on the technology maturation efforts to ensure that an inventory of supplemental low activity waste, cementitious waste forms, if produced, excuse me, if pursued, would meet or exceed regulatory requirements for disposal on site at Hanford's uh, integrated disposal facility, IDF, or at an off-site facility? Yeah, uh, Ben, you want to talk a little bit about the continued maturation of um, the grout uh, technologies and materials and how that would ultimately be considered um, for the treatment options at the Hanford site and, and disposal uh, relative to the waste acceptance criteria? Sure. So uh, that was kind of a question about uh, there's three types of grout, right? So we have grout that we're going to fill the tanks with when we're done retrieving. We have grout that we're going to look at for um, what you said, supplemental treatment, and that could be offsite or onsite. So our waste acceptance criteria would be based on whatever um, the performance assessment is for offsite or onsite. And then there's grout for uh, secondary waste which we have at ETF, uh, affluent treatment facility and other things that uh, we generate secondary waste as part of the vitrification process. So we're studying all three and it has to meet whatever performance assessment criteria that's out there. So um, for example, uh, our um, secondary waste is gonna go to the affluent treatment facility We'll turn it into grout and that'll go into the uh, interim disposal facility that's on site. And then we're looking at going off site with uh, uh, 
other waste treatment or on site. So it, we have to do the performance assessment. Um, PNL does a lot of um, grout studies. Um, we've invested a lot of money into the three types of uh, grout that we've looked at, like I said, within the tanks, secondary waste, and um, any supplemental treatment. So it, it's, it's all driven by regulatory requirements to do the, and we'll meet those regulatory requirements over the long term. And, I, and I'll just add that the grout technologies continue to evolve and improve. And we're always looking for opportunities where we can accelerate the mission overall, uh, because that's in everyone's best interest. And so I, this is an area where we continue to stay very focused and we'll continue to look at the science and um, really compare the, the, the science and the progress that science is making to the, the needs of the site and look for those opportunities where we can see a good fit. Yeah, so supplemental treatment, the issue is organics and um, phosphates. And we're trying to improve those grout formulations to make it um, feasible to dispose of it wherever we can, so. Thanks, uh, any other comments from panelists before we move on, David? I would I would just add that ecology is constantly monitoring and reviewing analysis of emerging technologies. Uh, to date, we haven't seen anything comparable and um, for the the most uh, the most hazardous waste we had on site compared to what the regulatory requirements are. Um, and you know it needs to meet or exceed the regulatory requirements, and that's that's really the key to any of these things. Uh, we're 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 willing to consider that. Um, we just need to as, as data comes forward, we keep reviewing it. And, for application or not. Thanks, Steve. I see you're, you're, you're off mute. My little finger is up there. Um, I would just like to comment that the, the Hanford Advisory Board has um, begun to discuss grout and some of the different options. But one of the things I would like to comment, regardless of regulatory requirements, and I've lived my entire career dealing with that question, Regardless of those requirements, there's sometimes just good practices. This is not a good site for some of this stuff. And we would like to see some of it leave. We haven't seen any waste leave here in a long time. And we're really concerned that there's really no place to send it right now. And there's no will to send it. So we would like to request that people think about a will to send it if there's somebody willing to take it. Thank you. All right, let's move on to uh, another question. Uh, what is known about the aquifer and the dynamics regarding contamination? Uh, Brian, this is probably a good question for you to, to cover. I think um, you can talk a lot about the groundwater program and provide a, a great response to that. I could definitely do it if I could find the mute button. Brian, but I got it. I think that was the, the first hit there. Um, appreciate the question. Um, you know, first of all, we've removed most of the sources of contamination along the Columbia River, um, including cleaning up over a thousand waste sites and demolishing hundreds of buildings. And that's the first thing is att attacking the source. And we've been operating treatment systems to pump the groundwater and treat it for more than 20 years now. And we've seen a significant reduction in areas of contam, much like what Brian showed you, I think about slide two or three, where you saw the plume reduction over time. Um, and then in the center of the site, up on the central plateau, we've been operating uh, treatments uh, for many years and have also reduced many contaminants there. Um, we continue to expand our network of wells as needed in the central plateau area, and we still have work to do up on the central plateau. But to kind of give you a, a, a gross overview of, you know, what is pump and treat and what does it do? The best way I can describe it is we go out there, we do sampling wells everywhere to have a better understanding of the levels of contamination within the groundwater. You can then model that to understand plume behavior. And then when you hear of us doing pump and treat, we will literally put a well pump, just like you would do to get groundwater at a, at a property, into the middle of that contamination, pull it out, run it through treatment, depending on what the contaminant is, that treatment uh, changes. So, um, you know, anywhere from, from ion exchange to resins to different medium to do that. Once the water's been cleaned to drinking water standards, it's re-injected into what we call injection wells outside of that plume. 
And so if you can think about it, you look at a big plume that's round and you're pumping out of the center and you're pushing into the outside in a ring around that, you're going to push that plume together to where ultimately you're getting that entire plume reduced and the contamination's re removed. And so when you look at statistics over our time, and this was as the end of last fiscal year, so September 30th, 2020, but uh, we've treated over 26 billion gallons of groundwater. So, so what, right? What does that mean? Um, I, I pulled up some stats here. Carbon tet, we've removed over 108,000 pounds of carbon tetrachloride, over 9,000 pounds of hexavalent bromine, over a million pounds of nitrates. And so the, the technology works. It's not just a Hanford technology. It's done around the country at super fun sites. And um, it is a, a great way that we can remediate from the production mission here. Thanks, Brian. Uh, David? Yeah, I would just add that I, I, I agree with Brian on source removal being your, your key first thing to do. Anything you can do to eliminate the opportunity for uh, discharge to get groundwater is your, your best source. It takes a long time, as Brian kind of depicted, to uh, pump and treat. And so trying to intercept it, and get rid of the source before it starts is the, the best remedy. All right. Uh, let's go ahead and move on to another question. Why is Hanford not looking to move away from vitrification to any degree? Is vitrification really sustainable? Well, I'll, I'll start. I, you know, I think we need to deliver the waste treatment plant. We need to start the vitrification process. Um, in the near term, it is the best way to start the cleanup mission and, and start making progress in an area of the site that we, we really haven't been able to, as Steve mentioned, uh, make progress on except for experimental uh, testing of just a few gallons here and there. Um, as I also mentioned, we are looking at other opportunities to apply other forms, uh, grout forms, for example, um, that could be used in, in certain uh, waste streams and certain uh, tanks with after a treatment process to stabilize or to to, um, to stabilize and then ultimately disposition the waste. It really, it, we continue to look for those opportunities across the board to drive the mission duration shorter, um, perform the work uh, safer, more efficiently and more effectively. And so we're not eliminating any uh, opportunities or options in the near term um, overall, but our, our primary focus, as you can imagine, is to deliver the waste treatment plant. Um, it's a major capital project where construction is now complete, well into startup uh, and commissioning testing. Um, that's the nearest and most, um, the fastest way for us to get started and start treating the waste while we continue to look for other options. But it is taking it is our primary focus right now as a site with our contractors to deliver that capability. And as I mentioned, it's both DOE offices, all of our contractors working to, together uh, to deliver that site-wide machine. But we're going to continue to look for other opportunities to safely and uh, disposition, treat and disposition waste um, and, and certainly work with ecology and, and the regulators in the state uh, as those options become uh, available and viable. Uh, affordable, achievable. We want to bring those to the table and have those conversations and work to accelerate the mission wherever we can. Other comments from panelists before we move on? I would just say if we've invested 20 years of equity into uh, LAW, let's just get it going. We we don't need another um, relook at different technologies. Um, high level waste is definitely glass. We're going down that path um, and we're committed to glass on the high level waste side. And as Brian said, we're looking at other alternate technologies to accelerate the mission, which could be grout offsite or whatever, but we, we spend too much time looking at decisions that um, we have to rethink and we just we just got to execute and we're right on the edge of, of starting this plan up and we need to do it so we're going steve 
Yeah, I'd just like to restate something I said earlier, and that is once once the collective body has made a decision and really gets started on something, it actually gets done. And that's what I really endorse in this effort is we've got to get this started so that we can, in fact, proceed because you know, the tanks aren't going to last forever. Something's going to have to happen. But we need, we need this treat, treatment capability. And we're very much cheerleaders for this process of moving forward. And I would just add, since there's an underlying theme in the question that we're, we're opposed to offsite disposal, and that's just, that's not the case. Um, you know, we, we look at the waste, we identify the standard that applies to it, and whatever alternative technology will treat that waste to the appropriate level and ship it offsite, um, we're here to, to help um, work through that and try and support that effort. All right, uh, moving to a question from our live session here. What chemical compounds might be found in tank waste? Well, I, I don't think we have enough time in the session remaining or in the evening to go through that list. Um, ben, can, if you want to cover a couple of the big ones, that's that's good. But I think it's a, a very broad spectrum of chemical and radiological constituents in the tank waste. It's, almost too significant to talk about in a session that's like this. Yeah, um, it's if you got the periodic table out, <laughs> you can go through all of them. But um, as as most people know that uh, cesium strontium is uh, the main constituents in that, where we try to re remove cesium strontium, and that's why we got uh, Brian Stickney's project where he's trying to get the WESF cells taken care of. But um, no, when you when you dissect the atom like that, it it, it does the whole range of that. And um, our our major issues are the cesium strontium part of it, I would say. And um, that's why we do a DF law where we're removing cesium and strontium. Strontium's the solids and I mean strontium's the solids and we take the cesium out and try to get most of that out so we can do the low activity waste. So but right. pure pure at a table. I'll her up. <laughs> Thanks for touching on that. Uh, let's move on to the next question, one that was submitted in advance. Um, I think this is probably for Department of Energy. What is the date and the life cycle cost for the completion of the Hanford liquid waste mission uh, tank farm closure, including shutdown and decommission of the waste treatment and immobilization plant facilities? So again, what is the date and the life cycle cost uh, for completion? Yeah, the life cycle cost estimate runs um, at the high end in the range of $500 billion. Um, the date, uh, through our modeling is at this point is in the, the 2070s timeframe, um, but we're continuing to, obviously, uh, we're looking for every opportunity we can to um, progress the mission more effectively, uh, do more cleanup in parallel within the available budget that's provided by Congress. And so um, those are the current modeling estimates. Um, and, and I think it, it's hard for me to imagine what that looks like in a dollars, you know, pile of money perspective. Um, but in reality, what we're doing every day is trying to find ways to safely accelerate the mission, um, looking at, at new technologies, new opportunities, working with the regulators for to, to gain agreement on ways that we can work together to find, um, apply innovation, apply uh, new opportunities across the entire spectrum of the work we do. So um, that's at the macro level, um, I, I'd say, uh, you know that that those numbers are publicly available, and I think those they've been published, and and it is a significant liability for the, the government. But we're going to continue to do our best at the Hanford site to to make the mission shorter, drive those numbers down, and make the mission uh, get there as safely as we possibly can. Other perspectives before we move on. Okay, uh, moving to a question that came in live. 
what are you doing to ensure high level radioactive waste at Hanford is not reclassified so as to make sure it does, it does actually get removed from the leaking tanks for the ultimate safety of the river and the people who live along the river? Well, that, that question is probably linked back to the determination or the clarification that the department made a few years ago on the definition of high level waste, really moving to more of a science-based approach than a, a source-based approach. Um, that, that approach is being applied in Savannah River with um, in a couple of different cases and, and they're seeing results from that. Uh, we are, we've agreed that we won't, we don't have any near-term plans to um, apply that uh, definition in the state of Washington. Um, and we've committed to sitting down with the regulator in the state um, with, if we believe there are options to accelerate the mission by applying that, that definition and there's so uh, we can gain agreement from the state uh, to do so, we would um, at the right time, certainly welcome that conversation. I think we'll, we'll have it when it's the time for that, but I don't, I don't see that as a, as a need in the next few years. And certainly I think um, we have plenty in front of us to, to get DF law started uh, finish the other or work towards finishing the other risk reduction projects around the site. Um, and, and, it, and frankly, for our near-term plans relative to direct feed low activity waste and tank waste mission, we have no intent or no need to apply that definition here in the state of Washington. And yeah, this is David. I, I don't want to go down the whole rabbit hole with high level waste interpretation. Uh, there's, there's just so many nuances to it. Um, from ecology's perspective, we're, you know, if we, the, the waste, we can get the waste um, treated and disposed of uh, appropriately offsite at, at a, a geological repository. Um, you know, we're, we're here to discuss ways to do that. The high level waste interpretation, the, the bottom line concern for Washington state is having um, the entity responsible for doing the, the cleanup and treatment and just, disposal having unilateral lateral authority to do that um, and having received that um, you know authority in the manner that it came through um, we feel that it's congressional action that would require that but the agency can't do that so that's the crux of the disagreement uh, on high level waste interpretation uh, as far as you know we don't want to see waste stranded at Hanford that um, was intended to be somewhere else so making sure there's a, a pathway that uh, of where that waste can be accepted and disposed of appropriately is really important to us. Um, but at the end of the day for public confidence and many other reasons, it makes sense to the state of Washington that um, you know, there's regulatory oversight, there's participation and transparency in uh, reclassifying waste. There are currently, um, there is currently a way to already reclassify waste. And my understanding is approximately 90% of the waste on site can be reclassified with the existing um, methodologies to do that. So, you know, I'm still wrapping my head around. Uh, I understand wanting to, uh, from a project management perspective, just give me the authority and let me go do, the, do my job and get it cleaned up and get it disposed of appropriately. I understand that. Um, from a regulatory perspective, we want to make sure that everyone's involved. It should be there's a public process to it, and uh, that the state has um, their appropriate oversight. Steve, yeah, I just wanted to mention that the members of the HAB have uh, mentioned to me a desire to start engaging in conversations on this topic. We haven't really yet done that. But whatever happens, we believe needs to be a very public process with the right kind of oversight. Um, there's a lot of good ways to deal with waste based on its hazard. And there's some bad ways of dealing with redefining things just so you can take a shortcut. And I think that we all would not benefit from that. And I don't think that's the intent, but that is a suspicion. And the best way to get rid of suspicion is to keep the doors open so we can talk. And that's what we'd like to see happen. Thank you for that. Um, just doing a time check here. I think we've got time for a couple more questions before we start to wrap up. Uh, another 
question that was pre-submitted. It's actually, it's a multi-parter, but they're closely related. Uh, when do you currently estimate the melters will start vitrifying real tank waste? And before the low activity waste treatment can begin, are there any design or other issues that have not been solved? Uh, how many? Uh, and do you plan? Do you have a plan for testing real tank waste in the system before fully starting up the vitrification process, including, you know, all that's all that's involved with components and materials? So again, when do you currently estimate uh, actually vitri vitrifying waste? Are there any technical issues? And are you going to be doing uh, testing with real tank waste? Okay. So yeah, I love I love multi question multi part question. So. Um, in response to the first question, um, I'll just say the first melter um, testing uh, heat up um, is 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 planned um, in our current schedule to start later this calendar year. It may actually occur in the first calendar quarter of 2022, and and we have a very extensive uh, testing program that is executed over. Uh, you know, a year to 18 month period um, using simulants, uh, using a lot of other um, elements of the testing process to, to really ring out the entire system. And then uh, before we actually get into hot commissioning, which is the actual, the part where we start to treat tank waste. Um, we're projected to start the treatment of tank waste in 2023 on the low activity waste side. Um, there are no technical issues right now that remain to be resolved. The design is effectively complete. There's always some design engineering that occurs uh, during construction and startup testing, but the design of the plan itself is complete. Construction's complete. Um, systems have gone, most of the systems, 50% of the low activity waste facility systems have gone through their startup testing and are turned over to commissioning. And the other, the rest of the, 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 uh, the, the lab, uh, effluent management facility, large portions of the balance of facilities at the waste stream plant are already turned over to commissioning as well. So um, Melter Melter one in late 2021, early 2022, just to start up the testing process, treating tank waste in 2023 through an extensive hot commissioning program and hot means radiologically hot, um, not just temperature hot and no technical issues. Uh, currently from a design perspective, we'll work through the technical issues that we encounter during startup and testing like any major capital project, but no barriers that I can see that would prevent us from starting the tank waste treatment mission in 2023. Thanks, Brian. All right, why don't we take one last question uh, from our live session here. How is the radioactivity of the water removed by the pump and treat system? What percentage of the contamination is removed before the water is returned to the aquifer or to the river? Brian, I don't want you to take that one. You did such a spectacular job on the last part. I think it's- I don't have the percentage part. offhand, to be honest with you. It's an iterative process. And so we go through and, and it's stripping off as much as it can until we get down to drinking water standards. Then we re-inject and pull out. So I'm not aware of the exact percentage offhand, but uh, it really depends on the constituent you have out there. And so for, for carbon tet, we'll use resins um, that will grab onto that, that we can run it through. Um, there's several other technologies out there. Uh, and again, these are pretty much done throughout industry. Um, and other super fun sites too. So there's nothing that's been created here. We're taking off the shit, all proven technologies and implementing it to accelerate our mission and reduce risk. Thanks, Brian. Uh, well, I think we've reached our end of time for questions this evening. And so now I'd like to turn back to our panelists for some observations and remarks. Uh, first off, thank you to everyone who participated and the questions that you submitted. Um, I'm gonna go in reverse order from our opening remarks. So I'm gonna begin with you, Steve. Um, so uh, if you could just make a, a few notes and observations in closing here, thank you. Well, I would like to thank you for what you've accomplished to date in minimizing the risk of the site to the river. And I will be on the river tomorrow enjoying your success. 
And a thousand years from now, when our descendants are going out there and doing whatever it is they decide to do freely, that your success will continue to play on them. And thank you for that. All right, thanks, Steve. Um, Dave Enan. Again, I will echo the thanks um, and, and I wish we did have more time for, to get to, to questions, but you know, these, these are limited. Again, thank you to the people who participated, submitted questions, paid attention, continue to pay attention to, to Hanford and continue to ask questions. Um, it's, it's, it's unbelievably important that, that people keep doing that. Um, and I wanna thank you, Ryan, for your facilitation. And again, I'll thank the, the, the tech team behind the scenes. And, and again, I think as, as Steve pointed out at the beginning, thank you to the 10,000 people who are actually implementing and doing the cleanup itself. So thank you. Thanks, Dave. Uh, David Bowen? Yeah, thank you, Ryan. Um, really appreciate the time tonight and everybody online watching and listening in. Uh, I, you know, six months on the job, and this is a conversation starter um, for me. Um, this isn't a, an end result or anything like that. There's so much for me to learn. There's so much happening on site uh, that uh, I don't think one person can actually wrap their head all the way around it. So we've got Right now, I've got about 85 staff who work on this uh, diligently on a, on a daily basis. They feel like they're doing work that matters. They are doing work that matters. And um, you know, I have chemists, I have engineers, I have hydrogeologists, toxicologists, environmental specialists, uh, and, and managers at different levels. And uh, their dedication uh, is, is, uh, is amazing to me um, for the complexity that goes on here. So I, I'm, I'm looking forward. I see some really uh, great opportunities on the horizon. I'm looking forward to DF Law coming on board and getting uh, treatment done and starting to go out offsite. And uh, I'm glad I can be a part of it. It's an exciting time to be a part of oversight, regulation, and um, cleanup of this site. So thanks, everyone. And have a great evening. And Brian, we'll end with you. Uh, with uh, for remarks from the Department of Energy. Yeah, th thanks, Ryan. I, I really do appreciate, Ryan, your effort, the, the team's effort to put this together and really for everyone to participate tonight. I think it's really important that we continue to maintain broad awareness of our important work um, and the, really the progress being delivered in a, in a cleanup effort that really is of national uh, prominence. Um, I believe at the at the end of the day, all of the, the panel members, all of us want the same thing, a cleaner, safer Hanford site, a cleaner, safer river. Um, and, and I think working together, uh, we, we, we certainly uh, can achieve that. I think it's our collective obligation. The only reason the Department of Energy is here is to clean up the site, that's our focus. Um, and we are working every single day with our regulators, with our local uh, state, regional, national stakeholders, with the effective tribes, to gain alignment uh, in, in how we do business um, you know, on a risk-based process to establish priorities. So every dollar we receive here from our taxpayers, we're able to deliver value. And that value is represented through risk reduction, risk reduction to the workforce, the public, our community, and the environment of the Pacific Northwest. Um, we believe in a virtuous circle model, which means as we deliver progress safely and effectively, Every day that creates support, broad support for our work. That broad support translates into congressional support and funding. And that funding gives us the opportunity to continue the mission. And so the, the more that we get engagement, the more that we get have constructive dialogue about the challenges, the opportunities and the progress, um, the more often we're able, we're, we'll be able to create successful outcomes. And we really do enjoy tremendous support from Senator Murray, Senator Cantwell, Congressman Newhouse, um, and the delegation, and we want to make it as easy as possible for them to advocate for limited federal dollars to support our work. And progress is our is our product in that world. I'm very optimistic. I'm optimistic of what we're accomplishing today. 
If you look back over the last few years, it's been a remarkable period of progress uh, in spite of the challenges. And because of those challenges, because of the teamwork, the maturation of the team, the maturation of the relationships, I'm incredibly optimistic about what we, what we can accomplish together. So really thank you for your time, your engagement, and I look forward to continuing these dialogues and these discussions in future events, because it's incredibly important for us to tell, talk about what we're doing, why we're doing it, what our problems and challenges and opportunities are together um, to continue to make the progress that I think we're capable of. Very little that 10,000 people working together can accomplish and we're working to achieve that every single day. So thank you all for that. Great evening, appreciate the questions. And I'll turn it back to Ryan to close us, closing us out today. Thanks. Um, so this concludes Hanford Live 2021. I'll echo thanks uh, to our panelists uh, for their time, uh, to the support team who helped to produce this event, and uh, most importantly to each of you who've been tuning in tonight. Um, I want to uh, echo uh, and reiterate uh, our interest in getting feedback on the event through our evaluation that we'll be sending by email to those of you who registered. Uh, thank you so much and have a great rest of your evening. Take care, everyone. <laughs>